Good evening. Yeah, yeah. Hello, Emerge Church. How are we doing? My goodness, it's like they got all the good looking people in Brisbane and put them in one room. Just turn to the person next to you and say, you look outstanding. Now turn to your second choice and say, don't get insecure. Stay standing, stay standing, stay standing. Stay on your feet. Stay on your feet. It's great to have you in church tonight. What an honour to be here. Can we thank the worship team? You guys did a great job tonight. <laughs> outstanding. And just what an absolute joy to, uh, to be at Emerge today and to speak across the locations. What a great church you've got. It's vibrant, it's life-giving and people getting saved. And it's just a great thing. You know, sometimes you can be in the midst of a great move of God and not even realise it. Here's a question. Does a fish know that it's wet? I, I genuinely don't know. I'm asking. It, it, I guess it doesn't. It just kind of thinks it's normal, right? And, and sometimes you can be in the midst of a great church and you don't even know it. You just think it's normal. Let me say, this is not normal. You've got great leaders. You've got great generations rising up. And God's really got His hand on this house. And so plug in, get connected, contribute, help make a difference and help build the future. Pastor Mark, it's just been a joy hanging out today. Just, you've just got great taste in food. Whenever I've hung out with you and Nina, we eat good food. And so I'm going to preach short tonight because there's a promise of good food after this service. you got great pastors, Joe. Can't wait to be in Noosa. I mean, do you need any more reason to sign up? Just, just write Noosa on the screen. That'll do. And looking forward to January. And uh, tonight, I'm really believing that um, God is going to do miracles in this house tonight. And uh, this morning, I, I, I promised that we're going to preach on worship. But then this afternoon, as I was praying for tonight, I really felt to switch lanes and preach about miracles tonight. And I'm really believing that there's going to be a lift of faith in your heart. And we're going to see miracles happen tonight. And in the coming weeks, there's going to be testimonies from a seed of faith planted in your heart tonight. Can we believe for that together tonight? So that's where we're going tonight. And so why don't we just lift hands to heaven? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that... This is your house. This is your service. God, we're not here just as a social gathering. We're not here just to fill in time, but we're here to encounter the living God. We thank you that your arm is not too short that you cannot save. Jesus, we thank you that you were anointed by the Holy Spirit. You went about doing good and healing all who are oppressed of the devil. We thank you that you were and you are a miracle worker. And so God, we lift hands of faith tonight. Open our hearts. I pray for those of us who feel surrounded by challenges and overwhelmed and intimidated by problems. We thank you for faith to rise. Father, we thank you that an impossibility is the seedbed for a miracle. Yeah, and so, Father, we thank you for that tonight. Father, for those who maybe don't normally come to church, I pray just help us to open our hearts to the reality of Jesus tonight, we pray. And in faith, everyone said, Amen. 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 You can grab your seat. Well, I want to start this message with um, a little bit of family history about the Bell family. Uh, I'm a pastor, but I'm not from a long line of pastors or even a long line of Christians. In fact, my mum and dad are the first Christians in their family line. Uh, let me tell you the story of my dad. My dad is not really, uh, wasn't really a religious guy. He wasn't really a church-going kind of guy. And uh, then he met my mum, and my mum wasn't a religious woman either. Well, when they got engaged, mum said to my dad, hey, I'd really love to do some travel uh, before we get married. And so dad said, okay, you've got six months. So she went backpacking around Europe with her best friend for six months while they were engaged. Well, while my mum was backpacking around Europe, she got invited to go to a crusade that was happening, a Christian event where there was a little known preacher called Billy Graham. And so my mum, with no church background, walks into a Billy Graham crusade somewhere in Europe, walks forward at the end of the meeting and gives her heart to Jesus. Now, you're excited, but my dad wasn't, because my dad never planned on marrying a churchy. Uh, that wasn't really the game plan, but he went ahead regardless. Uh, now, mum and dad had five kids, and I'm the youngest, and yes, I am sure that I was planned. And, um, and when I was a little kid, maybe two or three years of age, my dad um, suffered from really bad back pain. Uh, when he tells a story, he says that he hurt his back in a game of AFL when he went up to take a massive mark, landed it and came down and landed on his back. I think he just heard it farming. But either way, um, 
When I was about two or three years of age, my mum desperately wanted to go to this Christian church event in Adelaide, and so they called it a family holiday. They packed five kids in the back of the car, and they stayed at a church campsite near this event. Well, when they got to Adelaide, uh, my dad all day was on the phone trying to find a chiropractor because he needed someone to alleviate his back pain. And so um, mum had been to the church event on the first night. On the second night, my mum says to dad, well, why don't you go to the church event tonight and I'll watch the kids? Now, I don't know if dad was looking for relief from the back pain or relief from the pain of five kids, but either way, he jumped on the bus and he goes to the church event. Well, on the bus, when the drive there, he had to sit in the bus with 40 happy clapper Christians who sung choruses the whole, he's already got a back pain, now he's got a pain in the neck, like he is not happy. He gets to the church and he sits in the back row in this church meeting while there's a preacher preaching and this preacher's name is Yongi Cho. Now, let me just make an observation. I'm not saying that my mum and dad were total pagans, but what I am saying is God had to bring out the big guns to get them into the kingdom, right? <laughs> Billy Graham and Cho to get my mum and dad saved. So, so dad is sitting in the back of this church meeting, back row, listening to this Asian preacher preach, not interested. And in the midst of the sermon, he feels this heat running up and down his spine. He looks behind him to see who's touched him. No one has touched him. My dad's back gets instantly, miraculously healed in the middle of a church meeting. Well, they gave, they gave an opportunity for people to come forward and give their heart to Jesus. Well, how can you not after Jesus has just done that? So my dad gets saved. For, he was, his dad was a Freemason. He broke that in our family. Dad gives his life to Jesus. 36 years later, my dad is still in church, still worshiping God. All the kids are serving God because God, God is a miracle working God. So, so what are we to make of this whole miracle thing? Because there'll be some of us sitting in church tonight, arms folded like, oh, here we go. And what's all this about? And it's all a beat up. We find stories about miracles enthralling, don't we? Like, no one listens to that story and goes, boring. Like, there's something about miracle stories that catch our attention. I guess it's because miracles are just so out of the ordinary. It's Psalm 8, verses 3 and 4. The psalmist said this, When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you've set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him? And the son of man that you care for him. Who knows the idea that the God of the universe would humble himself to touch our lives. Who knows, that's a thought that, that is beyond our full comprehension. The, the Webster's Dictionary defines a miracle as an extraordinary event manifesting divine intervention in human affairs. Now, um, while the idea of miracles is wonderful, the whole topic of miracles is a topic which is embraced by some people, sometimes embraced too uncritically, and, and it's shunned or rejected by others. Here's, here's some of the different approaches people take. You know, when it comes to miracles, some people say, well, I like the morals of Christianity, but I don't really believe the miracle stories. Anyone ever heard someone say that? I like the morals. You know, I want to send my kids to a Christian school, teach them, you know, the 10 big ones, all that stuff. But, but I'm not so sure about all those miracles. But, but to believe in a Christianity without miracles is to believe in something altogether different to the Christianity of the Bible. You know, there's at least 37 miracles performed by Jesus recorded in the Gospels. Uh, he calmed the raging storms. He, he fed thousands with a little bit of bread and a few fish. He walked on the water. He turned water into wine. He healed a man with leprosy. He delivered men possessed with demons. He restored blind eyes. He raised the dead on three occasions. In his 38th miracle, he helped Australia win the cricket this week in the T20. And, and the Bible says that that's not an exhaustive list. John 21, 25 says Jesus did a whole lot of other things as well. If you were to write all of them down, even the whole world would not have room enough for the books that would be written. Who knows Jesus was and is a miracle worker. To try to imagine a Christ without miracles is like imagining Federer without tennis, Verstappen without F1, Elon Musk without Tesla or SpaceX. Who knows? It's what they do and miracles is what Jesus does does. Do you believe that tonight? And so you, you simply can't talk about Jesus without talking about miracles. In fact, if you're going to acknowledge the Christian faith and believe it, 
you've got to, at a minimum, believe three essential miracles. You, you could jot these down. The, the first is this, the miracle of creation. It's the miracle of creation. You know, you and I can disagree on the details, but the fact that we are here, the fact that there is something rather than nothing, that's a miracle. You know, it's amazing to me to, to listen to people who in one moment are willing to acknowledge that God is creator, but then in the next moment are not so sure that he could walk on water or turn water into wine. Who knows, that's kind of like saying, you know, I believe that Shakespeare could write Hamlet, but, but I don't believe that he would be able to move a comma in the manuscript. Who knows, if you spoke and created the universe, then you can probably turn water to wine as well. So there's the miracle of creation. Secondly, there's the miracle of the incarnation. The incarnation says that Mary, while she was a virgin, conceived miraculously and gave birth to a child named Jesus. Now, I love it every Christmas because you'll always read some stuff on Twitter where people go, Christians are such idiots, virgins don't have babies. And they say, you know, Christmas can't happen because that's not how babies are made. Don't you love it every time those condescending twats say that on Twitter? <laughs> Listen, champ, we know. That's why we put it under the column of miracle. Now, other people think that the virgin birth is a minor detail in the Christian story. You know, it's a, it's a little bit of creative flair. Add a few sprinkles to kind of, you know, you know, jazz up the story a little bit. But really, you can take it or leave it. Well, not really. Think about it. If the virgin birth is not true, what we've got is a promiscuous teenage girl with a fertile imagination, getting pregnant out of wedlock and raising her boy to believe he's God. That's hardly a story worth building a credible faith upon. And so to, to get into the entry door of Christianity, to acknowledge the Bible it is to acknowledge the miracle of creation, the miracle of the incarnation, and thirdly, the miracle of the resurrection. You see, for 2,000 years, Christians have believed that Christ died for our sins. He was buried in the tomb of a prominent, well-known Jewish contemporary called Josephus, uh, sorry, Joseph of Arimathea. He was raised from the dead and showed himself alive for, uh, alive for over 40 days to more than 500 witnesses. Now, again, some people say, well, I just can't see how that would happen. People don't just rise from death, right? That's kind of the point. Jesus' resurrection was considered as impossible and staggering then as it would be considered today. Who knows, people in the first century may not have had Google, but they still knew that when dead people die, they stay dead, capital D-E-D, -E -D, dead. <laughs> and so if someone is restored to warm, breathing life from stone-cold death, it's equally outrageous and unbelievable in any century. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, is this helping anyone tonight? We're going to land this, but I want to engage your head before I engage your heart, because some of you will find it hard to believe for a miracle because you've got too many objections up here. But, but if you can start to settle it here, you'll start to believe it here. Paul said, if Christ has not been raised, then all of our preaching is useless, and your faith is useless. Who knows, church, we cannot hold to a Christianity divorced of miracles because that's no Christianity at all. In fact, the Bible, the whole message of Jesus for the world rises and falls on creation, incarnation, and resurrection. And so a type of respectable Christianity without miracles is not the Christianity of the Bible. Now, other people say, well, miracles are something that happened a long time ago, but they don't really happen today. In fact, typically, if you raise the topic of miracles, some people will say, come on, it's 2021, as if that's an argument for anything. You know, there's this popular idea in our culture that even if miracles might have happened at some point in the past, in our modern scientific world, they're now probably no longer possible, and certainly they're not for believing among respected, educated people. You know, people believed in miracles back then, but we're far more enlightened now. I mean, we've got Netflix and Candy Crush. I mean, we're far smarter than those people. But who knows, if miracles can't happen in 2021, how exactly is it that they could have happened in the past? Has the fundamental reality of the universe changed? If yes, when did that happen? And why did no one tell us? Who knows, if we believe that miracles don't happen today, but did happen to our distant ancestors, what we're really saying it is not that miracles happened back then, but people back then were actually really naive. 
And that's why they believed in miracles. And so it sounds charming, but it's actually incredibly patronizing to previous generations. And so to be intellectually honest and consistent, it makes more sense to say, if miracles really did happen in the past, they can still happen today. But if miracles didn't happen in the past, well, they can't happen today either. Um, Other people say, is everyone tracking with me tonight? Other people say, well, the material world is all that there is. So any talk of miracles is nothing more than superstition. You know, this thinking builds upon the idea that science and the miraculous are incompatible, that they're competing worldviews. It kind of goes like this. You can be rational and scientific, or you can be religious and weird. I mean, religious and superstitious, but, but you can't be both. Adam Gopnik wrote in The New Yorker in 2013, we know that in the billions of years of the universe's existence, there is no evidence of a single miraculous intercession with the laws of nature. Bold claim, Gopnik. (laughs) Were you there for all billions of years to check that out? The late Carl Sagan glumly summed it up when he wrote, the cosmos is all there is and all there ever will be. You know, when a man or a woman holds to a strictly materialistic worldview and then they encounter a miracle, they have to turn away or deny it or explain it away because they've committed themselves to a naturalistic, materialistic worldview. But here's the amazing thing. As science progresses, far from supporting the view that science and miracles are incompatible, science is actually giving you and I more and more evidence for the very miraculousness of our own existence. Now, follow me. Has everyone had a coffee today? Is everyone awake in church today? Oh, we're we're going to nerd out for five minutes. Where are my nerds at? All right. Just, just hang with me for five. You see, science today teaches that the universe came into being via the Big Bang approximately 14 billion years ago. Now, people are going to have different opinions about the time frame, and my point tonight is not to discuss old Earth theories and young Earth theories. Joe will do that in the foyer afterwards. <laughs> Now, according to this generally accepted theory, all matter in the known universe, that is, more than 100 billion galaxies, each of which containing hundreds of billions of stars and many more planets, all of that exploded out of something smaller than a full stop you'd draw at the end of a sentence, which makes it the only explosion in history to be constructive and not destructive and to result in order rather than chaos which was really fortunate for us, right? (laughs) Further, the Big Bang Theory, it's a little plug for the TV show, the Big Bang Theory says that all the fundamental laws governing all the matter of the universe was set into place a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a second after the Big Bang. And so science also tells us that in the event of the Big Bang, all matter and energy in our universe came into existence. But I want you to follow. There's a problem with this. You see, the first law of thermodynamics says that energy and matter cannot be created or destroyed. Now, if energy and matter can't be created and can't be destroyed, how is it possible that all of the energy and matter in our universe was created in the Big Bang? According to everything that we know from science, that's impossible, but science says that's exactly what happened. So, what do you make of it? Well, while scientists agree that energy and matter can't be created or destroyed, there's actually no disagreement among scientists that energy and matter, catch this from outside of a closed system, can be put into a closed system. Now, some of you are like... (laughs) So, So let me summarize. All of the matter in the universe, including the galaxies, stars, and planets, were created with a big bang, which is what the Bible has said for thousands of years. But, but matter and energy can't be created. So how did matter and energy get here? How did we get here? Well, science and logic now conclude that the universe began when energy and matter from outside the system was put into the closed system, which we now call the universe. Now, think about this. Isn't that precisely what a miracle is? You see, A miracle is the injection of something from outside this world of time and space 
into this world of time and space. And if that's what it is, and if that's what happened when the universe was created, then doesn't it make sense that God could do a miracle again and again and again and again? If God is outside the system, and yet that same God can reach inside the system to create the universe, can't he also reach inside the system at other times to do what you and I would call miracles? Is everyone catching it? Just hit your neighbor and say, I got it. Now follow, we're about to tie all this together. Isn't the miracle of the virgin birth actually a lot like the creation of the universe in the Big Bang? You see, if God could insert the entire universe from outside the system, couldn't God insert a single sperm cell into an otherwise closed system? Come to think of it, isn't the resurrection of Jesus also a lot like the creation of the universe in the Big Bang? You see, uh, Oxford professor John Lennox writes this, what Christians are claiming about the resurrection of Jesus is not that he rose by some natural processes that would violate the laws of nature. No, Christians claim that Jesus rose because God injected enormous power and energy from outside the system. Now, unless you've got evidence that the system is totally closed, you can't argue against the possibility of miracles. And so let me summarize. It seems that the entire universe is here by some kind of miracle. That's not the Bible, that's science. And this type of miracle actually doesn't disprove Christianity. It makes sense of Christianity. And if these miracles have happened before, surely these miracles can happen again and again. In fact, surely that same God from outside the system could reach into the system of our lives and work miracles again and again and again. Do you catch what I'm saying tonight? And so we've talked about what miracles are, but, but let's just talk for a couple of minutes about the difference they make in our lives. Number one, if you're writing this down, miracles awaken our faith. Miracles awaken our faith. Who knows, miracles serve as a giant megaphone by which God gets our attention. God uses miracles to, to communicate with us. For example, my dad, who for 30 something years has been ignoring God, and yet the miracle serves as a megaphone to call him back to God. You know, the Greek word for miracle is the word simaios, which literally means sign. That's what miracles are they're signposts which point to something beyond themselves. Isn't this what God did for Moses in Scripture? Moses sees a burning bush. Peter has an extraordinary catch of fish, which every man believes for as a miracle. Daniel is preserved in a den of lions. And who knows, these three miracles were not just Freaky Friday spectacles. These miracles were a giant megaphone to get the attention of Moses, Peter, and King Darius. Psalm 77, 14 says this, you are the God who performs miracles. You display your power among the peoples. Uh, let me share with you the story of Darren. Um, Darren is our youth pastor at our Calvary campus in Emerald in central Queensland. Um, when Darren was five years of age, he was hospitalized and had to undergo six weeks of tests, which identified that he had full body juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, which was affecting every joint in his body. Um, the doctor's diagnosis was that they would, he would slowly lose the function of his whole body and then he was in a wheelchair by age seven. I think we'll have some photos. Darren had to leave school because of sickness and doctors and counselors basically told him, just get used to it because there's no cure for what you've got. Can you imagine what this does to the mind of a kid? Well, when Darren was 13, he went to a miracle night at his, at his local youth ministry and he felt the power of God touch him. The following Tuesday, he went to hospital for a routine checkup, and they asked him to stay in overnight for observations, and two weeks later, Darren walked out of that hospital. Wow. You know, four years later, four years on, Darren went back to his childhood doctor, who told him that if you look at Darren's blood work today, there's actually no trace of that disease left in his body. Today, Darren's our youth pastor in Emerald. He just had 160 kids at youth in Emerald two weeks ago. He's married, he's expecting his first child. Why? It's because God does miracles. And every time, every time God does a miracle, what God is saying is, hey, I'm here. I'm here because who knows, we need it because we're so distracted with our Netflix and our grocery shopping orders and paying the bills and dropping the kids to school that God has to break into the system and do a miracle to say, oi, I'm here, I love you, I've got a plan for your life, I'm for you, not against you. Miracles awaken our faith. Number two is this, miracles strengthen our faith. Miracles strengthen our faith. You see, Moses, 
had a faith in God, but he was still full of doubts, wasn't he? God had a plan for Moses. God wanted to use Moses, but his faith was shaky. Do you ever have days where you don't really, like you're not sure about your faith? Come on, be honest. There's a bunch of liars in church tonight. I do, and I'm the pastor. You have days where you're like, really? Oh. And so God wants to use Moses, but, but his faith is shaky. And so God says to Moses, all right, here, let's do some miracles. Um, take your stick, throw it on the ground. Moses throws it on the ground, turns into a serpent. Moses is like, ah! <laughs> and God says, pick it up. Moses says, you pick it up. And, and so he picks it up and it, it turns back into a rod. Why did God do that? God wasn't just doing it to be like, look, look how cool I am. What was God doing? He was trying to affirm Moses' faith. And then God says, all right, take your hand, put it into your jacket, puts it into his jacket, pulls it out, it's covered in leprosy. Moses is like, God, this is not funny. He says, put it back in your jacket, puts it back in, pulls it out, it's completely healed. What was God doing? He was trying to firm up Moses' faith because that's what miracles do. Who knows, God did this for the nation of Israel when he brings them to the Red Sea and the Red Sea parts. Now, who knows if the Red Sea parted every other Wednesday, it wouldn't be so spectacular. But, but the fact that it parted and it was miraculous, God said, hey, here's what I want you to do. I want you to tell this story to your children and their children and their children. Then God brings Joshua to the Jordan and they cross over the Jordan. There's another miracle. And Joshua says to the men, hey, get some stones from the riverbed of the Jordan and make a big pile of stones so that every time you see that pile of stones, you can be reminded that God did a miracle to bring you through. I think we need to tell miracle stories more often don't you? Because every time we share miracle stories of what God has done, it brings him glory. Psalm 105 says, remember, everyone say remember. Remember Remember the wondrous works that he has done, his miracles and the judgments he uttered. Number three, miracles stir our faith. And I hope this has happened in your heart tonight. I'm going to close with this. Miracles should stir our faith. Because who knows, if God did that for Darren, and if God did that for my dad, he was a pagan. then then maybe God could do a miracle in your heart as well. Who knows, if the system isn't entirely closed, then God could work in my life too. James 5 verse 16 says this, the prayer of a righteous person. Now, this morning we talked about the fact that a righteous person is not a perfect person. A righteous person is just a person who's put their faith in Jesus. The, the, The prayer of a righteous person has great power in its working. Elijah was a man with a nature like Hours. And he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it didn't rain on the earth. Then he prayed again and heaven gave rain and the earth bore its fruit. Now, I love those words where it says, Elijah had a nature like ours. You know, that's really important because sometimes when we read the Bible, we imagine that, you know, they, they shot fireballs out of their hands and lightning bolts out of their eyes and they didn't walk into a room, they levitated into a room and that they, they, didn't, they didn't inhabit the same universe that you and I do. But the Bible says, no, 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 don't think that there was anything amazing about Elijah. Elijah wasn't miraculous, but he prayed to a God who is. Let me share this story. Richard is, is one of the guys on our team at Calvary and his wife, Rachel, who's actually my sister-in-law, she was born with um, physical abnormalities that people born with don't normally survive. And so through a series of long operations, um, and literally with help from specialists right around the world, Rachel was the first person to survive and grow through childhood with this condition she was born with. Um, but, But then she was told, listen, it's amazing that you're alive. You'll never be able to have children. Giving birth is almost impossible. All of her internal organs are the wrong way around. Um, Well, well, Richard and Rachel got married and and they just started to pray. Obviously, they did more than just pray because they fell pregnant. (laughs) And, and, And Rachel will say that the pregnancy was incredibly painful. In fact, a whole lot of bed rest. And, and I think that's important to note because sometimes we think if God does a miracle, everything's just going to be perfect and I'm going to be walking down Lollipop Lane and there'll be gumdrops on the trees and it's all going to be amazing. No, no, no. It was a miracle she got pregnant, but then it was incredibly painful. Well, she ended up in the midst of that painful season getting a promise from God that this weakness would actually become her strength. And so Rachel gave birth to Mannix. Well, they were told that one child is improbable, but two children, that's impossible. So a few years later, they had their second child called Avalon. And then the doctor said, listen, once is improbable, twice is impossible, but three is a miracle. So God gave them a miracle and they had their third child, Zavin. Who knows? It's because God's a miracle working God. Now, 
You might say, man, Richard and Rachel are amazing. Not really. I like her sister better. And, um, <laughs> and he's a pretty everyday guy. Richard and Rachel aren't, let me say in Bible speak, they have a nature just like ours. But they prayed to a God who is miraculous. You know, I, I preached this message five weeks ago in Calvary. And um, one of our high school students on the Sunshine Coast, um, he runs a connect group in his high school. Well, he got so excited about this message, he, he went and re-preached it in his... Um, I was kind of flattered, um, <laughs> except he did it better. Uh, we've, put, we've put his version on the podcast. It's getting a lot more downloads. Um, he, he got so stirred to believe God for miracles that, that he took it to his lunchtime connect group and started preaching about how God wants to do... This kid's in grade 10 at Nambour Christian College, about an hour away from here. Well, there was a girl in his class who had lived with a liver disease since she was a kid and had been told that this kind of liver disease, ultimately it's fatal. It, it will take your life once you get older. Well, they, you know, when you're in grade 10, you, you just believe. You're not old enough to get cynical yet. You just believe what God says. And so they prayed for her. Well, after praying for her, literally in their school lunch hour, a few days later, she went to her doctor for a checkup, and the doctors confirmed that the disease is now gone. That's about three weeks ago at a school on the Sunshine Coast. Check this out. Now what they're doing is now they're about to remove a feeding tube that this girl has had in her since she was four years old. That was a grade 10 kid. Some of you oldies, what are you doing with your life? Like how it made it that it was you, not me. Um, grade 10, isn't that what the Bible says? Let young people be an example of faith. And why wouldn't you believe that irrespective of age, irrespective of how long you've been in church, how much of the Bible you know, listen, you can have a nature just like ours and yet pray to God and believe Him for miracles. Do you believe that tonight? Come on, why don't we stand to our feet? We're gonna take some time to pray, to worship God now, because I just believe that if you call upon God, then God can do great miracles. You believe that tonight? You know, I think, um, can I give that to you? Man, look at those biceps. Sheesh. Um, you know, some people say, but, but yeah, Dustin, good pep talk, but, but what about if I pray and nothing happens? You know what my answer would be? Well, you know worse off. Is that too pragmatic? If you pray and nothing happens, well, you're not worse off for the experience. You just, as you were. But, but what if you prayed and God did a miracle? What if, what if you took a step of faith and God responded? Doesn't the Bible say that it's faith that pleases God? It's faith that attracts the power of God. Jesus said, according to your faith, let it be to you. And so some of us tonight need to start to lift our faith and say, you know what? The system is not closed. God could do a miracle. God could reach into my life. He could turn that health condition around. He could bring that wayward child back to faith. God could do a miracle in my life, in my house. Come on, who believes that tonight? I really believe that tonight. You know, just one more story. We preach this on Sunday, the 17th of October. You know, my phone on the 18th, 19th of October, Tuesday morning, I got a text from one of our Connect leaders in our church saying, you know what? There's a lady in my Connect group. She had five cancerous tumours that were visible. Tuesday morning, we get a text message saying there's no visible tumours. She's been completely healed. Why? It's because God does miracles. Hey, these are, not, these are not stories from like 100 years ago in Africa. These are stories from like three weeks ago in Budrum. God can do miracles in your life tonight.